So I, I thought maybe we could start quickly just by uh, helping me get a sense of who's in the background. I know in the uh, attendance. I know that's kind of a mixed crowd. So how many people here are technical? Uh, okay. What about policy, legal, and like businessy folks? Okay. Cool. Great mix. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, DAO liability. Uh, I'd want to start by talking about uh, a concept from this woman, Carlota Perez, who's a Venezuelan uh, economist. Uh, and I think this is a great uh, analytical framework to take when you're discussing crypto law and policy. Uh, and I think what Carlota does uh, in particular is she identifies a cyclical relationship between uh, law and technology. Uh, and the way that this relationship works is uh, with every technological paradigm of the, of the time, there develops a legal framework that is best adapted to that paradigm. Um, and what happens over time then is that when the new technological uh, paradigm develops, it is in conflict with the prior uh, legal framework that has developed, and, and, and therefore, the legal framework acts as an exclusionary mechanism that drives the development of this new technology in the fringes. So this is a little bit of a deeper dive into Carlota Perez's framework. And you can see in the uh, bottom left uh, eruption is when this new technology uh, is born. And then there's a period of frenzy, which is where uh, this Technology is developing, attracting a lot of capital. Again, still kind of in the fringes of the regulatory framework. Then there's a turning point, uh, which is typically brought about by a catastrophe of some sorts or some big event that forces a realignment between the old, now obsolete regulatory framework and the new technology of the day. And then that leads to kind of like the golden era where there's like a synergy between the both and a uh, maturity. So my uh, thought is that we are here. Um, and frankly, we might even look at the events of last summer uh, leading up to like FTX's collapse as the big event that's potentially going to cause this realignment between um, the regulatory framework and the technology. Uh, OK, so what are we going to talk about today? Uh, I want to start by uh, going over the couple of regulatory enforcement actions uh, against DAOs. Uh, then I want to talk about some of the private litigation against DAOs. Uh, and once we have these couple of examples on the table, uh, try to distill uh, some themes in what we can call DAO litigation. Uh, and talk about how that's affecting DAOs and their members and, and what they can do to protect themselves. Um, and I should have said this at the beginning, but I very much welcome questions and interruptions and corrections from you guys. Um, so what is like my big point? Uh, my, meta, my meta thesis here is, uh, that we DAOs are basically facing a wave of litigation that could threaten their existence and operation in the US. And that's because, as we'll see, there are certain kind of procedural advantages that plaintiffs have when suing DAOs uh, that make it very favorable for them to bring these types of claims. And unfortunately, the regulatory framework hasn't developed to the point where DAOs are, can be like fully recognized or protected uh, from their activities. Um, so we're going to start off by talking about uh, UkiDAO, uh, which is notable because it was the first regulatory enforcement action against the DAO, and it also uh, was the subject of uh, related private litigation. Uh, so UkiDAO uh, was formerly known as the BZ, B0X protocol. Is anybody here familiar with it? Yeah. Uh, so it's it's basically like a DeFi 1.0 version of like a lending protocol. It allowed you to trade assets 
uh, go long and get some leverage. Um, it was founded by a couple of guys in the United States, and um, it didn't really exude a culture of like compliance. Uh, they, uh, as, as we'll see later, um, they like advertised heavily, like there was no KYC. They ended up getting uh, hacked. One of the developers was fished uh, and lost a bunch of, uh, ended up losing a bunch of crypto in the protocol because he had the private keys to it. Um, so what happened? Um, Oh, sorry. Yeah, this is this is also a key point. Um, the like many DeFi protocols, uh, it was developed by you know a couple of people and a company and a development company, and then later they uh, issued a governance token and basically allowed the holders of that token to control certain admin keys of the protocol. Um, they have this like really unfortunate quote that the CFTC picked up on and that I think has driven a lot of the outcome of the litigation, where the founders are basically saying, everyone's getting you know, sued around us. Like, it's really unclear what the regulatory framework is, so we're just going to basically decentralize as a regulatory arbitrage strategy. right? Um, and it did not work out that way for them. <laughs> uh, so the first thing that happened was that the CFTC sued the two founders um, and the development company and settled with them for a pretty modest fine, $250,000, which in CFTC terms is like a slap on the wrist. Um, but it was a pretty curious settlement because it basically found the founders culpable for behavior during two separate periods. The first period, the CFTC said, you guys were the owners of this company that developed a protocol and then the protocol basically allowed people to trade commodities on margin. Um, so they were talking about Bitcoin and Ether specifically, and the fact that you could have leverage on the protocol, right? And they said, you know, this is an uh, activity that is typically only allowed to be done by what's called like a, a DCM or FCM, which is like a highly regulated uh, intermediary that there's no way like a crypto startup could ever become one. Uh, so they, they found them liable for that period. But then they said, you were also liable for after the, uh, you guys did the governance uh, token drop and the uh, DAO had some sort of admin key control over this protocol. You were also culpable during that period. Um, and then, so I, up to here, this I think it was kind of like an aggressive uh, you know, enforcement action, particularly like that finding them liable for that second period but nothing kind of out of the ordinary. What I think really riled people up was when they uh, turned around and like concurrently also sued the quote unquote DAO. Um, so maybe like to put it out to the audience, why do you, how would you explain this behavior on the part of a, of a regulator? If you already got the two founders and the development company, why would you go ahead and sue the DAO after? Sure. Chilling effect on DAO participation, or to say that just because you're a DAO doesn't mean you're immune from the law. Yeah. So yeah. I, I definitely do think it had a chilling participation uh, effect on participation. I don't know if that was the goal. I think the goal was the second point that you said, right? It's like in their mind, they look at that quote and they're like, "That says we're going to decentralize, so there's nothing to enforce against." And they're thinking like, "If it's illegal to run a DCM as a company." Well, it sure shit should be legal to run it as a DAO, right? So in their mind, they have this equivalence of the role that a development company and the kind of founders of this protocol have with the role that a DAO has. Um, so yeah, they have this, this basically, this whole theory of liability is underpinned by their conception that there's a transfer of control uh, when the DAO token holders get uh, some admin rights to the to the protocol, um, and then we have a quote from the CFTC chair saying basically like this was so egregious that we had to do something. Uh, we couldn't just like stand by and do nothing, right? Yeah, please. When you say that it was sued by the, the they sued the DAO. Does that mean that the like DAO members themselves are culpable, or that there's no concept of like limited liability here? 
for so that's one of the key issues that we're going to drive at. But I can just address it now, right? Um, the critical point when discussing liability of DAOs is that they're uh, potentially uh, assumed to be an unincorporated association or a general partnership, and that's kind of like the default business entity that the law will assume if people get together to do a business without forming like an LLC or a C Corp, right? They'll just say, well, you guys are general partners. And the real like draconian result of that is that then any member of that general partnership can be what's called jointly and severally liable, right? So if you're running a partnership that you know creates $10 million in liability, and you're the a creditor to that, or like a, a enforcement agency can pick any member and say you owe me now ten million dollars, and then that member gets the right to go fight and ask for uh, recovery from the other members. But you know, good luck recovering money from an anonymous frog on the internet. Um, so yeah, that that was um, that that's like the crux of the issue, basically. Um, and I guess a couple of um, other points to tease out before we move. Uh, how do you serve a DAO? Like they don't have offices, they don't have you know addresses. So what the CFTC did, and this almost sounds like a joke, is they literally went on the front end of like the Uki protocol. They clicked help, and there's like a little chat thing that pops up, and they're like, here's like the complaint, right? And then they also put it in like the governance forum. Um, legally, like this created a bunch of questions as to whether that's like proper service, right? Because if ultimately what can happen is you're holding any token holder liable for that action, like are they really going to get notice of this lawsuit? Um, so a bunch of what are called amicus, so like uh, people that are third parties to a case, including first uh, LexPunk, which is a kind of DeFi advocacy group that was funded. Uh, from uh, Treasury of, uh, was it, uh, it wasn't USOP, it was the, I forget, I think it was Compound and one other DeFi protocol. Um, and then DeFi Ed Fund, uh, as well as two funds, two VCs, Paradigm and Andreessen, both filed amicus briefs, basically arguing that the, what the CFTC had done here didn't uh, meet the bar for like proper service, and we, we ended up losing on that point. Um, and then I guess another key point to tease out here is that when you're um, saying that DAOs are general partnerships or an unincorporated association, you have to basically uh, engage in like a line drawing exercise where you've got to figure out, all right, like who exactly is part of the DAO, right? Um, what the CFTC said was anybody that held tokens and voted even once on whatever governance proposal happened was a member of the DAO. So then you can start thinking about all these absurd like hypothetical situations where like what if I, you know, bought a token, voted on a governance proposal to like change the background color of like the front end. Now I'm like a general partner and like the, running like a unregistered DCM. Or like what if, you know, the proposal was like do we want to run a DCM and you say no. You still now voted on a governance proposal and it kind of like dragged along, right? Uh, so there's all these kind of weird fringe cases that come up. Um, so and this might be like a little bit nerdy uh, or like too legally, but um, where we are procedurally in the case was, um, and this is still, all these cases are still ongoing. Um, the judge has now ruled that the uh, DAO, the Uki DAO was a unincorporated association for the purposes of receiving process. And he did that just by basically going to the definition of unincorporated association in the California code, saying there were two people, more than two people. You guys all agreed to form a business when you received these tokens. Um, and they have like a sufficiently lawful purpose, which is to, to control this protocol, right? Uh, and again, the, the quote in the bottom highlights this uh, theme again, which is like, you know, you can't evade liability or responsibility by decentralizing, right? So you here have the, the judge saying, the protocol itself is unregistered in violation of federal law. Somebody must be responsible. 
And uh, so I think that the key from this last slide is just to note that uh, the ultimate liability of the DAO and the members has not yet been determined. So far, it's only at the point of like, has the service been proper? So I think there's still like a, a second part of this case, like the, where the merits are going to be adjudicated. And so far, the CFTC has indicated um, in its briefing and in oral arguments that they really only want to enforce whatever judgment they get against the DAO, and I presume that means like the treasury, but they're not going to try to like go screw any individual token holders. But again, doctrinally, that's where this could lead, right? Yeah, two questions, maybe up in front. Yeah, um, I'm curious to know how did they establish jurisdiction on the DAO provided it's, it's centralized? So why does CFTC think that they have jurisdiction to regulate it and not another, another regulator or authority elsewhere in the world? Yeah, so the question is, uh, on what basis did the CFTC uh, find that it had authority uh, to, to have this judgment against the DAO, given that potentially token holders all over the world, right? So that's, that's a good question. It was briefed in the, um, in, in the amicus briefs a little bit. Um, and I think the, the, there was a, a little anecdote. This might be like two in the weeds. Um, but uh, in one of the hearings, uh, we were basically arguing that, right? We were saying, you don't know if this, like, the token holders are in France. Like, how are you going to say that this is abiding by like, the French like, service of process rules? And then the CFTC lawyer said, no, no, no. We know that the two founders uh, were in the US, right? So then what the judge ended up doing was ordering the CFTC to serve the founders in the US uh, for purposes of like accepting this um, uh, process and, uh, and the got like this amazing response from the founder's lawyer because again like the founders had already settled right so the lawyer was like got your letter as you know like we settled this like a month ago and part of the settlement said that they could not be uh, participating in any more DAO activities and were not authorized to receive this process so thank you uh, but I can serve it right so I thought it was like awesome, and I was like hooting and hollering when that came out. But uh, the judge, again, I think mostly driven by like this theory of like equity of like I can't just let them evade liability, um, found that the process was uh, was okay. Um, I mean, the other jurisdictional hook, right, is the users, the U.S. users, were able to access the the protocol. Was there a question back there? I guess kind of related. Uh, so how do you like not go to jail? Do you just set up like a <laughs> thing in, in like a, like do you set up the DAO, let's say, in like an overseas place, and then they just can't send you something? Like how, so. How this is a, a good reminder to give my disclaimer that I'm not giving any legal advice, <laughs> and the views here are not the views of Paradigm. Um, So I'm trying to figure out how to give you a satisfying answer. Um, so the, <laughs> the question is, how do you go to jail? How do you not go to jail? Uh, and uh, basically, whether offshoring the operations works. Um, so um, I'll, I'll try to answer it this way. The US regulators have like an amazingly expansive view of their jurisdiction. Um, like look at like Avi, you know, like uh, or like they brought a bunch of cases. Basically, if if any of the products are available to U.S. users, even if that is by a U.S. user connecting through VPN, like in violation of the terms and, of, and conditions of the protocol, like they will find that enough to to find you liable, right? So I I don't think. Um, it's, it's, you're not going to dissuade them by being out of reach. Like there was one amazing quote uh, from Arthur Hayes, uh, the BitMEX founder, uh, who like, you know, was found guilty of like AML violations, where the government attached as an exhibit to the complaint 
uh, his tweet that said, I'm incorporated in the Seychelles, come at me, bro. <laughs> right? So like they really, they don't take lightly to that, right? Um, and the other thing is like when, so, but you're right, like a lot of the projects, like at least knee-jerk reactions are like, it's so messy here, it's so risky that I'm just going to go offshore. That doesn't really work unless it's like truly an offshore project. And by that mean, what I mean by that is like, you know, U.S. users aren't able to access it even like through like VPNs. Um, and it's not controlled by a U.S. person, right? Because there's a lot of tax, I think a, a, a big footfall that projects make is they don't consider the tax implications of that. And there's a lot of uh, tax rules like ECI, like effectively connected income, like PIFIC, uh, CFC, uh, controlled foreign corporation laws that basically mean that if they're designed to avoid like, you know, offshoring income to like low tax jurisdictions. So if you're found to uh, basically be controlling economic activity outside of the U.S. from the U.S., the IRS will come get you and like charge you penalty fees. So I guess the long answer, the long-winded answer is um, going offshore is like a understandable reaction to the uncertainty here, but it's not, in my view, uh, a foolproof solution because the regulators still think they have jurisdiction, and if you're controlling it, you're going to have tax issues or like regulatory issues. Uh, but yeah, I mean, like I see a ton of like uh, Cayman foundations, Panamanian foundations, currency trust. Every kind of you know cycle, there's like a new, more exotic flavor of it. Um, but I, I don't think it's going to really stop regulators. Um, okay, so that's uh, the CFTC. Now I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about the uh, SEC. And maybe I should have not presumed understanding of this, but like the CFTC is the commodities futures uh, regulator, right? They regulate like derivatives and they like basically were created to regulate things like pork bellies and like oil futures and stuff like that, right? Uh, SEC is securities land, right? Um, and they're like been the main antagonist of the crypto industry. And there's also been this interesting dynamic where they're basically both kind of vying for the opportunity to be the main regulator of the crypto spot markets, which if you think that you know, crypto is going to be a huge part of the economy from the agency's perspective could be like a huge power grab, right? So the SEC has done a lot less on DAOs specifically, but did their first thing much earlier, right? So do folks here remember like the DAO hack? So this was like the Slocket DAO, right? That was like basically like a VC fund that everybody was super excited about. It got hacked and led to the fork between Ethereum Classic and Ethereum, right? Um, so a few weeks after that happened, the SEC issued uh, what, what is called like a 21A report, which is not um, an enforcement action. It's just like a guidance to, to the market, right? And what they said was basically uh, the... Tokens in this DAO uh, were securities, um, and they met, and they were securities because they met the definition of investment contract. I'm sure everybody here is familiar with the Howey test, right? Um, so this was basically like the first salvo in that whole discussion, um, and the point that they made, right, was um, even though every, and sorry, I should say the. The Howey test is this test designed to basically determine when a arrangement that could otherwise look like a commercial arrangement really is a securities transaction and should be brought under the like umbrella of securities law and like all the added disclosures and liabilities, right? And what it basically tries to get at is if you're uh, in, if you're giving somebody else money with the expectation that that other person's going to go away and do something else. Um, and because of their effort, you're going to get more money back, then that is a security, like notwithstanding what form it takes, what the ultimate like, you know, object of it is. And, and what that means is that the person that's taking money should give the public a bunch of disclosures and should be liable if they lie about this, right? Um, so then the question is, what happened to everybody voting in this, right? Like, there's not, you're not really relying on somebody if everybody gets to vote uh, on what you're doing. 
Um, but what the SEC said was basically the, the voting rights that the DAO token holders had were very limited. Uh, they focused on the role that this basically like whitelist curator had who had the power to admit proposals for the DAO. Uh, and they said, since there's this kind of gatekeeper personal role here that is responsible with admitting or denying any proposals, you don't really have um, like a, a full control right, of this, right? Uh, and they also weirdly said that because they were decentralized and anonymous, it was going to be very hard for the token holders to coordinate. So therefore, they couldn't really, like, uh, they had to rely on somebody. Was there a question back there? No? Sorry. Um, and then, so we didn't hear anything about DAOs from the SEC until uh, our friend Avi. Uh, so are you guys familiar with like the Mango hack that happened a couple of months ago? Uh, so uh, this, this guy, Avi Eisenberg, uh, basically did like an Oracle manipulation attack on Mango Markets, which is a lending protocol in Solana. Uh, and what he did is he basically took a position that was collateralized by Mango and then you know, put a bunch of bids and uh, trades on exchanges that fed the Oracle price to the protocol so that he like pumped up the price. That allowed him to basically use his collateral to just wipe out all the other assets in that protocol. And then when he stopped manipulating the price of Mango tokens, the whole thing came crashing down, right? Uh, and then he like owned up to it because he's like a code is law type of guy. Um, God bless. Uh, <laughs> And he then got arrested in Puerto Rico, like the day after Christmas or something. And he got sued by the DOJ, the CFTC, and the SEC. They like all dogpiled on top of him. Um, and so uh, focusing on the SEC's enforcement action specifically, what they said was uh, Eisenberg violated the anti-fraud and anti-manipulation rules because the underlying tokens were securities. Um, and again, this is kind of like a, a DAO token that allows you to vote, uh, not this too dissimilar to the um, Uki DAO tokens, right? Um, and they said that the DAO was an unincorporated business, uh, an unincorporated association, so similar again to, to the Uki uh, formulation. But I think one kind of key tension between the view that the CFTC holds and the SEC holds uh, the CFTC is telling you, you guys are all general partners in this business because you're voting tokens to quote unquote control a protocol, right? Um, and therefore, you're potentially personally liable. Uh, the SEC, on the other hand, they want to try to argue that they have jurisdiction, so they need to find that the underlying token is a security. But as we discussed, um, general partnership interest, because all the partners are voting, are often thought of as not being securities, right? Because there's no third party there that you're relying on. You're all kind of in this together. So um, again, similar to what they said in the initial DAO report, they basically said that, yeah, 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 like you Mango token holders, you have some voting powers, but you don't really have voting powers because uh, they're, I guess not everybody was able to make proposals. They also said that not everybody would be technologically sophisticated enough to make a proposal. Um, so briefly, what was then Eisenberg's um, defense? I mean, it seems like manipulation pretty clearly, but why did he think that he was not acting in bad faith? Uh, I mean, he's like a code is law, like maxi. So he, and, and that seems like silly to lawyers, but there is a, admittedly, like a divide into like what, from what the crypto community or like the more kind of extreme parts of the crypto community think is like fair game, and what um, you know the rest of society thinks is. <laughs> so the, the, he basically said, "Hey, like I didn't you know steal anyone's password. I didn't impersonate anybody. The code was functioning as it was designed. I was just able to you know understand how it would react better than the team, right? And I mean, I think he's kind of arrogant, and and I'm not surprised that he got arrested." But at the same time, I kind of think that we need people like Avi if DeFi is going to be able to like be hardened over time, right? Because so I don't know. I'm kind of conflicted about people like him. Yeah, because it kind of well, taints the whole 
the whole space, right, in a negative light, if he just was taking advantage of just rules that aren't written? Uh, I think it could taint the space. I think it could also make it more resilient, like make the old, like applications more resilient, right? Um, and like if what we want to do is develop systems that um, you know are able to coordinate uh, relationships without the need for relying on the law to like um, enforce those, I I'm kind of sympathetic to his plea to like you know kick the tires on everything. Um, I wouldn't suggest tweeting about it or like coming to Puerto Rico for Christmas. But was there a question back there? No? All right. um, so where does that leave us? <laughs> In the words of Matt Levine, um, it's like the, wor the worst of all worlds. Uh, because you are similar enough to shares that you are dealing in securities. But as you guys all know, like stock gives you limited liability. But you're also s different enough that you kind of look like a partnership and potentially are a general partner, right? So not great. Um, OK, so that was basically the big uh, federal enforcement actions against Dallas. And now I wanted to tick through a couple of the uh, private ones. How are we doing on time? OK, uh, I'll try to go quick. Um, and obviously, like um, what the federal government is doing is directly impacting what private litigants want to do, right? So the first one here is uh, pool together. Uh, have you guys familiar with this one, this protocol? So it's like a no loss lottery where you would basically deposit uh, ETH or crypto in, in the smart contract. The smart contract would then like LP on like Aave or Compound and it would get that yield, and it would basically raffle it off to people. Uh, so you never lost your principal, and you got like a chance at getting some upside from the yield. Um, and the plaintiff in this case was a self-described um, concerned citizen who thought that the like crypto is like boiling the ocean. Um, so he bought uh, like twelve dollars worth of uh, like he got you know twelve dollars of some stable coin deposited into this protocol, and then sued every, in, uh, like the founders and all the investors, basically claiming that they were acting as a general partnership running this um, unincorporated uh, association, which is like an illegal lottery. Um, and then this same firm, over time, has now brought three different uh, class actions against DAOs. And interestingly, you can see how through that progression, they're like sharpening their arguments and also pulling in from what the regulatory enforcement actions are, are doing. So in this first one, for example, they argue that all the partners, uh, all the investors and the founders are members in the general partnership. But they, interestingly, don't sue the quote unquote partnership or DAO, right? Uh, the next one was the private litigation in the B0X case. Again, this is the same thing as Uki, just like the class action version of it. And here, the plaintiffs were people, they were like DGENs that had a bunch of money on Uki and lost some of them like up to like you know $450,000 in the hack. And then they said, you guys were a general partnership running this business. You owed us like a duty uh, to like you know, run it in a safe manner. You, you breached that by letting the dev get hacked. Um, uh, and then this is the, the latest one to be filed. Uh, this one was particularly painful for me because it named Paradigm and it was filed the day after a holiday party. So I was like, you know, uh, sipping a cup of coffee with a headache trying to figure out what we were going to do about this. Um, it was on a Friday, too. Um, and so what they did here was they basically sued the Compound DAO um, and like a bunch of the big named investors. And they said that it was an unregistered offering of securities. Um, interestingly, they focus on like the liquidity mining program as the actual offering, um, even though they didn't get any plaintiffs that participated in that. Uh, the couple of plaintiffs that they got were like people that got like ten dollars worth of comp by like watching those videos on Coinbase, which I think is like hilarious. Uh, but anyways, they again, you know, um, I guess there's not much more to say about this one. 
And, and all these cases are still ongoing, and none of them have reached like any uh, resolution on the point of whether a DAO is an unincorporated association, other than Uki in like the limited service context. Um, so this is like uh, the underlying claim is uh, unregistered offering of securities. And so when you're a plaintiff in that, you basically are asking for what's called rescission. You're saying, uh, you sold me something that should have been registered, but since you didn't register, register it, I get the right to like basically put it back to you, right? So it's almost like a put right that you get at the end. Yeah? What do you think is really behind these claims? I, I, I don't see why anyone should sue for $12. Um, yeah, so the interesting question. Um, I can get pretty conspiratorial about this because like class actions are very expensive to, to bring forward, right? I think part of what explains this, frankly, is like a plaintiff's law firm that is just being an entrepreneurial and like wants to make this their niche. Uh, they also see it as a big business opportunity, right? If they end up getting certified. So the, the way that class actions work, um, you'll have like the first like lead plaintiff, but then you'll certify a class, right? So it won't only be the person that put ten dollars. That's just the person that files the first suit. Then they will then be like anybody that you know contributed to this protocol ever or like in this period gets to join in. Um, but I do. I have wondered whether like there's some third party financing here, uh, but I don't know. Um, and this is the latest fun uh, patent trolls. Uh, so are you guys familiar with like the patent troll industry at all? Um, so these are basically companies that will buy up patents and then just sue tech companies uh, for infringement. And it's like a pretty basic business model, right? If it costs you uh, less to enforce the patent than like you get the payout, then you make some money and you just try to do it at scale. Uh, so a lot of these patents are frivolous, or patents are invalid and like the lawsuits are frivolous, but just because it's a pain in the ass to deal with, they end up squeezing money out of people. Um, so uh, publicly, there's been one troll that has sued both uh, MakerDAO and CompoundDAO. Uh, they have this like incredibly broad patent that everyone tells me should not be enforceable that basically covers any uh, off-chain data, uh, like any Oracle data getting pulled on-chain. Um, and they have now sued both DAOs, and again, like um, they're they're making their way down the court, the process, right? So, I guess th this is another key point that I wanted to uh, distill from all these uh, litigations. Uh, so, why I think this is so dangerous is because DAOs don't respond, because DAOs are typically like super disorganized. They don't have like a CLO, uh, so when you know, somebody sues a quote unquote DAO, there's no like real institution there to respond. And because of this limited uh, joint and several liability issue, if I'm a member in a DAO, like why the hell would I want to raise my hand to defend this, right? Because if I do it and I lose, then I'm like first in line to pay for everybody else. Uh, so what happened is this dynamic has come up where plaintiffs can just file lawsuits against DAOs knowing that no one's going to stand up and defend them. They'll get to score points while like the other team's off the court. And then once, uh, when that happens, right, like in judicial process, if nobody shows up, the judge can't do anything other than issue a default. That basically says, you know, there was a proper lawsuit and like nobody showed up to defend it, so you lose. Um, and then the plaintiffs, this hasn't happened yet, but this has to be the end goal. They get that default in one hand and then they go find um, like the DAO member that has the most money or is like the most visible and they go try to enforce it on them, right? Uh, so it's a really shitty setup for DAOs. Um, okay, so what are some other, uh, and, and I'll just breeze through these because we're getting close on time. Uh, other questions, uh, I mean, I think the, the question about choice of law and like jurisdiction is a big one. So far we've been litigating um, in like you know Northern District of California, SDNY, uh, but I think over time, especially as these uh, cases start to proceed against individual members that are not in the U.S., these questions of choice of law are going to become much more 
uh, naughty and, and difficult. Uh, the service issues too, right? Um, so far, the plaintiffs have survived the service challenges. Uh, but again, I think that as these uh, cases move forward towards individual members, um, there's going to be more defenses for that. Um, so I think the, the like, you know, main question is, are DAOs some sort of unincorporated association? Um, one key way to try to analyze this is if you think about token holders as being kind of like joint members in the business or whether they're just joint owners of property. Uh, because you can own you know, an apartment complex like with your cousin or something and you're not a general partnership as long as you're not running a business. So I think this will still be decided. Um, I think a lot of what's going to drive this, frankly, is unless there's some other theory of liability that can find the most like reprehensible conduct liable, they're going to end up saying that DAOs are unincorporated associations. I think the real question now becomes who's in? Like, What do you need to do to be part of this uh, general partnership? Is it voting? Is it just holding a token? Is it making a governance proposal? Is it like you know, passing some sort of proposal? Uh, so I think that's still unclear. And then another, like, this might be like nerdy and, and technical, but if, if the underlying theory of liability is this is a general partnership uh, where all partners are jointly and severally liable, then it's kind of hard to get private plaintiffs, right? Because if, for example, in the Uki case, like those people were using the protocol and they also had like B0X tokens. So you're basically, it's like that Spider-Man meme where like they're all pointing at each other, right? Because the plaintiffs themselves could also be potentially jointly and severally liable for the actions of the general partnership that they're suing. Um, um, and then kind of some more um, technical ones. A lot of the regulatory strategy for DeFi protocols has been to try to push this distinction uh, technologically, but also kind of uh, th theoretically between like the front end, which is what the development company will kind of control and like say they're liable, li liable for, or responsible for, and then the, the protocol, which they'll try to wash their hands off and say, oh no, like that's just you know, open source software uh, that we don't necessarily control. Uh, there's going to be a lot of stress into that distinction. Um, and similarly, like um, all the, the, the whole theory of liability, at least from the CFTC's perspective, is that the, there's a transfer of control between the developers of this protocol and the token holders. Um, I think that's like really a warped view of the world, and like I don't, I don't understand uh, the equivalence between those two. Uh, but it's clear that there's like a lot of confusion here. For example, uh, CFTC Chair Benham, uh, in like a, I think last week was giving a speech about the CFTC's recent enforcement actions. And in referring to Uki, he said that he like even butchered it more. He said that the protocol had converted into a decentralized organization. Uh, so like before it was like, uh, you know, it was the control of it now, but now it's like the whole protocol becomes this DAO. Um, in my mind, like when a token holder is voting on something, it's not operating a protocol and it's not really controlling it, right? Like there's obviously different levels of admin rights that you can have to a protocol, but you're not voting to say like, yes, let's open like this margin position for this one person that's coming to our site. Uh, so I think that'll be a big battleground. Um, so what can DAOs do to protect themselves? Uh, there's no kind of perfect solutions. I've done a fair amount of research into uh, like DAO wrappers, which are basically legal entities that DAOs can form. Um, you guys might have heard of kind of like the Wyoming DAO laws, or we talked about kind of the offshoring structures earlier. Um, so I think it's an interesting area. There's a lot of kind of experimentation. There's no perfect fit. And a lot of these corporate forums, especially the more traditional ones, uh, introduce a lot of restrictions into the operation of the entity, right? So like, if you're a DAO LLC, like you can't just become a member 
uh, of that LLC by buying a token. You would have to like sign a legal agreement, right? Uh, there's a lot of issues with like anonymity. You can't necessarily preserve anonymity in a lot of these corporate forms. Um, and then I think people also get very confused with the offshore structures uh, because a lot of these structures are what's called like ownerless entities, which are basically like a trust structure, right? But it doesn't necessarily give limited liability to the token holders because the token holders aren't members. They're not shareholders of this entity. This is just a trust that's set up to basically benefit some sort of purpose. Um, people are, are thinking about defense funds and, and trusts. I know that Maker community just approved like a five million DAI uh, fund for like defense. I don't think they've uh, like put it in action yet, but people are, are thinking about that. Uh, and then third party organizations. Uh, so there's been a lot of kind of amicus briefing in these legal uh, cases on the uh, patent troll matter specifically. There's been some pretty interesting uh, like patent specific solutions. Uh, we've been trying to coordinate with a uh, organization called Unified Patents, which uh, exists pre-crypto uh, to fight patent trolls. And what they do is basically they uh, create zones where they will admit members who will uh, cross-license technology to each other and then put money in a, like a pot. And then Unified Patents will just sue any troll that like, messes with any other members. So it's, it's uh, basically a deterrence mechanism by just increasing the cost of any troll uh, we'll have in like trying to enforce against these people. So it's like a, they don't kind of negotiate with terrorists type of strategy. Um, and I think that's it. Yeah. How did I do one time? Cool. So I'm happy to answer any questions and I'll be hanging out for a little bit after this. We have time for one question. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, I had a question on pool together because that's kind of similar to like the premium bonds product that's in a non-blockchain um, context, right? In the, that, the what products are like premium bonds. So basically, you'll put your money into a savings account, and then you have some chance of winning extra yield one month. And that's been in like a non-crypto, like a traditional fintech space. There's been some companies doing that. Um, so what about crypto makes it different that? then the SEC has some kind of jurisdiction over that. Uh, so I, I, I don't know enough about the like uh, comp here to really answer it. Um, I th so I think the underlying claim is that it's an unregistered uh, security. It's not really an SEC, sorry, it's an unregistered um, uh, lottery. So it's not necessarily a, it's not the SEC suing them. It's a private plaintiff saying that they're running an unregistered lottery. So for all I know, the these other companies that you're talking about have like the required licensing to, to do a lottery in New York or whatever. Um, I think the other meta point to make is I like I hear this a lot as like especially when I was outside counsel, they're like, oh, how come you're telling me I can't do this if like that person's doing it? Like that's not the in crypto, like that's probably because that other person's like doing it wrong. Uh, <laughs> Or, or like just has a higher risk appetite, you know? Um, so yeah, uh, that's kind of a circular answer, but sorry. All right, thank you so much for the, for the talk.